Howdy folks, today we're going to talk about daytime handbands, so stay tuned. Alright folks, so let's talk a little bit about daytime handbands and what they mean. So when we talk as hams, it's generally accepted uh, wisdom to say things like the higher bands are better in the day versus the night. Uh, what we're going to try to do in this video is answer why. There are a few things that make these statements true. Um, so let's go ahead and discuss it now. So what we're going to cover are a couple of things. Um, we're going to give an overview of the HF bands, talk a little bit about what they are and a little bit of history. We're going to take a quick look at the ARRL band plan, and we'll talk a little bit about how to use that. Uh, we're going to talk about propagation types a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the ionosphere, and then we're going to talk about some of the daytime band characteristics. Uh, this is really important right now because as we go into Solar Cycle 25, we are getting some enhanced propagation uh, based off of the conditions of the sun, based off of the, um, the state of the ionosphere. And uh, there's really going to be some great opportunities for folks to get some, some good contacts in, especially during the daytime hours. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about our ham bands. Um, we have the original HF bands, 80, 40, and 20, and they have been available for amateur use since October 10th, uh, 1924. The 10 meter band first became available to hams on October 4th, 1927. The 15 meter band became available to hams on May 1st, 1952 as a CW only band. Uh, this one's interesting. The 60 meter band became available for use on March 5th, 2012. It's a channelized band, it's five channels, uh, where hams have secondary use privileges. Um, you also will hear like short wave broadcast uh, on the 60 meter band. The other thing is, is that there are some rules around effective radiated power out of your antenna versus peak envelope power, which is typically how we do things. So there's some extra rules and considerations that uh, you need to take into account when operating on 60 meters. As a result, I don't do it. Um, and then technically, uh, the 160 meter band is medium frequency or medium wave band. Um, it's generally not considered a daytime band. Uh, we'll talk about it a little bit, but uh, ground wave propagation, and we'll talk about what that is, um, does make uh, 160 a viable local option during the day. So I just wanted to take a quick second to talk about what are referred to as the warp bands. And the reason we're doing this is sometimes there's confusion where uh, like 15 meter band, for example, is not a warp band, but people will refer to it as a warp band. So I just wanted to clarify that a little bit here. So in 1979, three additional bands were allocated for amateur use, 30, 17, and 12. And this was at a conference called the World Administrative Radio Conference. Um, and that is how these bands became known as the work bands. Now, amateur radio operators, they share these bands. Um, and these are really small pieces of spectrum. These bands are small uh, comparatively. And we'll see that when we look at the ARRL band plan. Um, they're shared with shortwave broadcast. Now, it's generally accepted practice that hams will refrain from any contesting activity on these bands. And just another th note about the work bands is, is that 17 and 12 meters, um, when, when we use a lot of ham radio antennas, they generally will work on the other bands, the more established ham bands, not that 12 and 17 aren't established. But you'll have, again, fed half waves, for example, that are harmonically resonant on 10, 20, and 40. So it makes a lot of sense that you would be, you would be on those bands based off of your antenna. To do things like 17 and 12, maybe you have to set up a secondary antenna or maybe build a dipole or something along those lines. Um, there are all band antennas like 9 to 1s, for example, that uh, you may be able to operate on those bands. But generally, given their size, given the uh, antenna conundrum that I just explained, um, you don't see a whole lot of people on these bands. Now, as we are getting into the solar cycle um, 25, there is going to actually be a lot of opportunities for 17 and 12 uh, to, to be some good bands for, for making some contacts. So maybe, maybe things will change. So here is the U.S. Amateur Radio Band Plan um, outlined by the ARRL. This is a fantastic document. Now, I know that other people say, well, it's a little confusing. It's a little difficult to read. And as a result, I use alternatives to this. I don't really use the alternatives to this because I've always used this and uh, it has met my needs. But here you can see uh, characteristics of the bands from 20 centimeters all the way up to 2,200 2, meters and where you can operate on these bands in a particular mode for your license class. So it's really helpful for that. Also, you can see uh, some of the size of these bands. 
So, for example, if you take a look at the 20 meter band, it goes from 14 megahertz to 14.350, which means the band is 350 kilohertz uh, wide or in bandwidth. If you take a look uh, directly below that at 17 meters, it goes from 18.068 to 18.168. So it is 100 um 100k and so that would mean it is less than a third of the size of the 20 meter band and that's what i mean earlier by saying that some of these work bands um, like 17 and uh and 12 meters are smaller anyhow great document i would recommend everybody has a printed copy at their station so we want to talk a little bit about the types of propagation uh, because the types of propagation directly impact the types of operation that we're going to do and then how we can be successful in making contacts so the first one that I have here is line of sight propagation. And line of sight is when a radio wave moves directly from a transmitting antenna to a receiving antenna. Um, a good example is a mobile radio to a repeater or two buddies out hiking in the woods using an HT or a handheld radio. The uh, next type of propagation that we were going to talk about is ground wave propagation. And this is when radio waves moved, uh, moved from a transmitting antenna to a receiving antenna across the surface of the Earth, typically uh, considered short-range communications. This works better with lower frequencies and vertically polarized antennas than with horizontally polarized antennas. So uh, vertical is straight up and down. Horizontal means that it is parallel with the ground of the Earth. Uh, a good example here is an AM broadcast radio. And think about your experiences listening to AM uh, broadcast radio. I know it's not as popular today as it was when I was a youngster, but during the day, I can hear some of the local AM stations, and I'm hearing them via ground wave propagation. As it gets darker and as the night progresses, there are things that take place in our ionosphere, and when these take place, uh, sky wave propagation becomes possible for AM broadcast, and now I can hear stations from further away. And so that's one of the reasons why we would consider a 160 meter band um, a, a nighttime band. Uh, we wouldn't consider it a daytime band. The last thing I have here is sky wave propagation. And this is what uh, ham radio operators are mostly uh, excited about. So this is when radio waves move from a transmitting antenna to a receiving antenna after being reflected by the Earth's ionosphere. And the example I have here is amateur radio HF uh, DX communication. Now, a signal can actually take more than one bounce off of the ionosphere, or one hop, as it's called. So that's when a signal would leave your station, go up, reflect off the, the sky, right, the ionosphere, come back down to the ground, reflect off the ground, and then back up to the sky, reflect down to another station. Um, and it is a pretty cool thing when that happens. So what I want to talk about now is how does the ionosphere impact HF propagation? Conditions in the ionosphere cause radio transmission to behave differently depending upon frequency. Ionospheric conditions can vary greatly based off of time of day. So there is a term that we should all be familiar with as HAMS, um, maximum usable frequency or MUF as it's referred to sometimes. This is the highest frequency that can be used to communicate via sky wave propagation at a given time. And what's important to notice is that if, for example, the MUF is 14.3 uh, megahertz, transmissions made at 28.5, they'll penetrate the ionosphere and then travel into space. They will not be reflected back down. Now, with the extra ionization that we're getting in the ionosphere due to increased solar activity, we're seeing higher MUFs than we have seen in previous years. And what this means is, is that we can use higher frequencies or higher bands to go ahead and make longer communications based off of sky wave propagation. So, for example, you may see 10 meters uh, becoming more and more popular uh, in recent days and hear more people talking about that. Because we're able to make more contacts on 10 meters because the muff has gone up to somewhere around the 28 megahertz. In certain circumstances, there's lots of websites that you can take a look at to see what the muff is in your area. There's another concept that we should be familiar with, and that's the lowest usable frequency. During daylight hours, the D layer of the ionosphere absorbs RF, generally at lower frequencies. So that's one of the reasons why we talk about like 80 meters, potentially even 40 meters, not being daytime uh, bands, daytime hand bands. Because of the conditions of the ionosphere, those, those frequencies, they get absorbed. They don't pass through like the muff does. They get absorbed, and they don't get reflected back down. 
And as a result, this makes uh, communications for long distance not possible. So what I really wanted to note here is that this is really strange. Like your, your workable bands are those between the lowest usable frequency and the maximum usable frequency. But what can happen is, is that the lowest usable frequency or the LUF can sometimes be higher than the MUF. And what that means is, is that sky wave propagations are not possible. And chaotic things can happen like this, potentially in solar storms. Okay, so let's take a few minutes to talk about the different bands and some of the characteristics there. Um, 10 meters is the first one we're going to talk about. We're going to work, work from a higher band to, to the low, or higher frequencies to lower frequencies. Um, what's unique about the 10 meter band is, is that they're small antennas, um, but 10 meters is highly dependent upon solar cycles. What uh, is, you know, kind of a funny story is I got um, my, my general license back in the last solar cycle when 10 meters was, there, there wasn't a lot of solar activity, so 10 meters didn't work very well. And, you know, I built a 10-meter dipole, and I'm thinking, hey, I'm going to make all these contacts. I'm going to be cool, and I'm going to be awesome. And I didn't. It, it, didn't, it didn't work out very well for me. Um, things are changing now with the new solar cycle, and we were talking about the maximum usable frequency and some of those conditions. What I'm encouraging everybody to do is go out and build a 10-meter dipole. Um, they're, they're small. They only have to be 5 meters, right, because you do a half-wave dipole. Um, so you're looking at a small antenna, small footprint, and you're actually going to be able to do some pretty good things. Um, with them. Now, in lower solar cycles, there is a thing called sporadic E when you can use the E layer of the ionosphere to do skip and, uh, and make some longer distance contacts. But right now, we are actually able to get some pretty good sky wave propagation. 10 meters is a really large band, so there's a lot of space on there. And when we have a higher solar cycle, I imagine there's going to be a lot of activity. Um, it's very popular when it's open, and you hear hams today talking about how excited they are about the new solar cycle because 10 meters is going to be available to them. Um, and when it's open, good DX is possible. So that uh, if there's one takeaway from this video, it would be get yourself a 10-meter dipole, get it up in the air uh, pretty good, and then uh, see what you can do with it. We talked about the 12-meter work band. It is a very small band, uh, 100 kilohertz. You don't see a lot of users on this band, um, and it is very dependent on solar cycles. It's not highly dependent like 10 meters. It's a little less dependent, but it's still still pretty dependent on them. Um, the 15-meter band utilizes the F2 layer and can be pretty good for long distance. Um, it is can be more dependent on solar cycles for, for long-range DX. Um, what's interesting about it is it's got a harmonic relationship to the 40-meter band. So a lot of times people will have 40 meter capable antennas and they can also get 15 as a result. And because of that, you generally will see some more activity on 15 than you do bands like 17 and 12 because the harmonic relationship with 17 and 12 doesn't exist the same way. 40 meters is very, very popular band as is 20. Um, so what we have on 17, again, work band is very small, 100 kilohertz. Um, it can be good for DX. Uh, there's not very many users there, and it is, becomes a little less dependent on solar cycles um, as we go further from 10 to 20. Now we're on to slide two, so what are the daytime bands? And the first one I'm going to talk about is 20. Um, this is probably the most popular band. Uh, it's used a lot in soda and poda activations. Um, it's used a lot during the day. It's used a lot during the night. It can get super duper crowded, especially when there's events or cont uh, contesting happening. Uh, one of the reasons is, is that you can get a reasonably good 20-meter uh, antenna in a smaller package installed in your backyard, and uh, it'll perform pretty well for you. Um, it's a very, very popular, and it works well um, during the day and into the night, and it can even be dependable in lower so solar cycles, and is generally considered the best uh, band for, for DX and getting long-range contacts. Um, again, very popular. Um, I have 30 meters on here. And now that is a medium distance during daylight, it can be very good at dusk and dawn. Uh, sometimes it performs better at night, and that's kind of the thing that's going to happen as we go lower in frequency to like things like 40 meters. Um, one of the things I really like about uh, 30 meters is, is that you can, like with, with an antenna that is that um, multi, multi-banded antenna that has resonancy on 20 and 40, sometimes with the use of a tuner and not a lot of tuning required, you can get uh, you, you can get the you can get the thirty meter band, which is which is fun and it's it, it's cool and um, there's more people on that than some of the other bands that we talked about seventeen and, and twelve for example, um, and it's and it can be good for contacts both day and night. Um, forty meter band, um, it's shorter distance during the daylight. It can be pretty good at dusk and dawn, but better at night. 
and it's considered kind of like a long haul or a long DX uh, nighttime band. Now, during the day, a lot of people use 40 to rag chew and they use it for nets. And the reason is, is that it works well during the day as a, what people would call an Envis or a Nevis antenna. So uh, without getting too complex, when a takeoff, so let's just pretend this is your antenna and your signals are coming out of your antenna, the direction of which the signals come out of your antenna is called your takeoff angle. You can adjust your takeoff angle to varying degrees of steepness, which in turn will dictate how they reflect off of the sky when we do sky wave propagation. So what a lot of people will do with a 40 meter antenna is they'll mount it low to the ground and direct their, um, their signal almost straight up. And it's called your incident signal. Um, and when it, goes, when it goes straight up, it's considered near vertical. It goes up and it bounces back down uh, in close proximity. So 40 can be a daytime band for uh, local or, or regional communications, and people have a lot of success with that. But it's not considered uh, generally a bread and butter, long distance daytime hand band. Probably going to get a bunch of hate in the comments. I've been using 40 and during the day for 35 years. Listen, I'd love to hear all about it, but uh, down in the comments. And that takes us to our next slide. Okay, okay. I didn't mention 60, 80, and 160 meters. And the reason I didn't is they're not really, they're not really uh, daytime bands. And, uh, you know, I'm just going to give some perspective and some thought on these. Um, 60 has the special rules. Uh, it can be popular for Envis, like 40. And, you know, my friend Charlie over at Red Summit RF, he tells me that when he does soda activations, he's always on 60 meters. And I believe him because he's got an honest face. But uh, <laughs> what, I, what I'll say about that is, is that, I don't think that 60 is used when I, when I talk to other hams, I don't hear a lot of people talking about 60. There are people who use it and love it, but those people generally are few and far between. Um, 80 is, this is large bands. Um, a lot of people refer to it as 75 and 80 meters. There are a lot of nets on, uh, on the 80 meter bands. Um, mostly these people are using that uh, via Envis. Not always, but most of it is kind of like local regional communications. Um, via Envis during the day. And then 160 is considered the top band. Um, you know, when you start to get into 80 meters and 160 meters, you're talking about these huge, huge antennas. Um, and in the case of 160, we talked about it being technically a uh, medium frequency or medium wave uh, band, not an HF band. Um, but you can do ground wave propagation during the day, but because it's, uh, we're focusing on sky wave propagation, I didn't include it here. Anyhow, that is going to wrap up the video. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, or recommendations, go ahead and post them below, and I'll do my best to respond. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it.